I want to talk about the definition and the challenges of global sustainability. And this really should be seen as, as a concluding uh, sum up of the whole class, because that's really what I'm doing here. So the definition includes protecting ecosystems, preventing and adapting to climate change, uh, reducing air and water pollution, ensuring that we get healthy food and enough of it, developing land and handling waste to ensure that we don't poison ourselves, also preventing human conflict because, you know, no matter what else we do to preserve the planet, the technology of mass destruction has advanced to such a degree that everything we do could be wiped out uh, in a, uh, a thermonuclear exchange uh, that should terrify us and, and certainly does. Then I'll talk about how this will be financed, the organizational and management challenges, and finally the role of government and public policy uh, in stimulating this. So we'll start with the definition, uh, which is really something we've been talking about through most of the semesters. <coughs> now, I focus a lot on local issues because in the sense, the environment is something you perceive and, and experience as an individual at the community level. But all local issues, when you have enough people on the planet, can in essence become global issues. Sustainability issues should be thought of really as a continuum from some that are almost purely local and can in fact be contained uh, to those uh, that have actually impact global systems. So, and, and the interaction of these uh, should not be underestimated. I mean, the whole environmental issue starts with people like Rachel Carson tracking DDT and how it literally uh, came through the entire uh, global ecosystem. And Barry Common are doing the same thing, looking at nuclear testing that takes place uh, in the Pacific, showing up in the milk supply in Wisconsin. Because those chemicals you could actually trace because they were so unique in the environment. So, the, so we learned about the interconnectedness of the environment. And Commoner, in his landmark book, The Closing Circle, made the point that he, he created these laws of ecology, and one of his was everything is connected to everything else. And in terms of our planet, that's true. But everything is not as connected as everything else. Some things, in fact, are more global than others. So we need to be thinking about uh, sustainability issues in terms of those things that have planet-wide impact because those are going to be the toughest problems to solve like climate change because our, our nation states are still uh, the way we govern ourselves and frankly they will stay the way we govern ourselves until the threats to our security come from other planets and uh, I don't know that that's going to happen in my lifetime maybe it'll happen in yours but for the moment national sovereignty is going to remain. Our goal is to manage human impact on the planet's natural systems. We are biological creatures, see? Even, even Kermit. And so we need the planet in order to survive. And I thought by now that we would be, have, we would have transcended our need for the planet, but we haven't. We don't live in other planets. Uh, the Columbia University, the Earth Institute, actually at its very beginning, operated something called the Biosphere 2 uh, in Oracle, Arizona. That's where the MPA Environmental Science and Policy spent its first year. We didn't live inside the dome. That experiment had been gone. But in fact, that experiment didn't work. Uh, we really don't know how to live uh, in a self-sustaining uh, ecological system. We don't understand all of the variables and we didn't there. Uh, someday we may have the technology to create our own resources, you know, those replicators on the Star Trek uh, rocket ships, but we don't know how to do that yet. And so we are stuck with this planet and we better make sure that it survives because if it doesn't, we don't. We need though to develop a sufficient understanding of our Earth system's processes to manage them because our impacts are now global and so great that we have to, as we produce the things we need to live on, we need to minimize our impact on the planet. And we need to increase the technology of observation, but also 
of energy. We need to focus on preserving biodiversity, treat waste, and we have to figure out how to detect weapons of mass destruction technologically so they can't be used. We are going to need to make sure that there is never uh, a dirty bomb going off in Times Square because the minute it does, uh, all bets are off. And we need the organizational capacity to manage sustainability on a global scale, which means everybody here needs to know enough about organizational management that when these good ideas are developed, you can help make them happen in organizations. So let's focus first on ecosystems. Our knowledge of the ecosystems that we need to support life on this planet is very incomplete. We're destroying oceans, forests, and freshwater habitats worldwide at a rapid rate. If you listen to my colleague Shahid Naeem or Don Melnick from the uh, ecology uh, department here at Columbia, you, can, you, you will easily be terrified by what they have to say. Um, so we need to increase our understanding of the science of ecology in order to decrease our negative impact on those systems. Ecosystems are complex interactive webs or networks, and preventing damage is difficult, and some damage is irreversible. So we need to learn more about it so that when we do the things that we want to do, that we, we don't, in a sense, kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. Climate change. The planet's temperature is constantly changing and has done so throughout history. We know this. But, as I said earlier, with nearly 7 billion people on the planet, and in this country we have hundreds of millions of automobiles, the idea that it has no impact on the atmosphere is ludicrous. And scientists have been demonstrating this impact for a while, and it's so uh, unambiguous that uh, you know, it's not really worth discussing it. But what we don't know is we really don't know the impact. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and that's, in fact, where some of our scientists have gotten into trouble. They make projections, uh, and they're only projections. And so we need to be a little bit more modest in how we do that. But we know that this is happening. Um, and the reason it matters is that our settlement patterns, where we live, where we have our farms, where our infrastructure has been developed, is trillions of dollars of investment in a given planet, in a given set of temperature. And so if that changes radically, then those investments are out the window. I mean, this is a coastal city. New York City has over 600 miles of coastline. And some of, it is, is, some of the neighborhoods in New York are uh, very close to sea level. Some of it is built on landfill. Uh, my, the, my home in Brooklyn was not, but two blocks away it was. Uh, I, I, and the part of Brooklyn I'm from is called Flatlands, and that's not because it was mountainous. So, you know, Columbia University is on Morningside Heights, but Manhattanville, where we're building our new campus, is very close to sea level. And so, the, in the World Trade Center, when it was built, they had to build a bathtub under it for drainage reasons, and a big retaining wall to keep the river out. So, when you think about uh, the, um, the adaptation to climate change, it's going to cost a lot of money. So we need to be thinking about how to reduce that, essentially to protect our investment. Now, what's interesting is the, the reason why the global climate uh, issue has made it on the political agenda, finally, in large measures because of reinsurance and insurance companies, companies like Swiss Re, who have billions at risk if this stuff happens, okay? Uh, because they're they're the ones who are insuring these investments. And, and they have been starting to think about what does climate change do to the risk profile of our portfolio? And a lot of it's not so good. And then when you think about in, you know, changes in weather patterns, so you have more hurricanes and more flooding and more people living in coastal cities. So we're gonna see uh, these kinds of uh, natural disasters as a regular occurrence in our, uh, in our world at, with more and more human impacts. And so we've, we're going to have to develop ways to provide emergency response and reconstruction on a regular basis. I mean, it's going to be like the modern version of the fire department. Climate change poses profound challenges to our international political regime because it, the problems are caused everywhere and their impact is in the future. It is the classic example 
of the overgrazed common field, as somebody mentioned earlier today. In the case of climate change, though, the most severe impacts may take place in the future and far away from where we cause the impacts. And in, as a political matter, those are the toughest problems to solve. So I would not underestimate the problem. And so that's part of why I don't think the problem is going to be solved by a direct assault on climate. It will get solved by changing the energy use that we have. The low carbon green economy is within our reach technologically. We could actually make this happen if we decided to focus our attention on it. You know, just as we decided to go to the moon in 10 years, you could decide to accelerate the process of moving to a fossil fuel free economy. And I think that uh, I was hoping that was going to happen under the current administration. I think President Obama wanted to do it. Uh, I think he's run into a political uh, problem in trying to make that happen. Okay, let's turn to air and water pollution. Our economy can be managed to minimize impacts on air and water. I mean, EPA itself in the 1970s and 80s demonstrated that because there used to be these curves which showed gross domestic product going up, pollution going up at the same or greater levels. In the mid and late 1970s into the 1980s, we see GDP going this way and pollutants going that way. So the technology of pollution control is there. We can apply it, we can develop it, and it is advancing technologically. Urbanization increases stresses to air and water resources, but is amenable to technological fixes. We can actually manage our air and water resources, and we have done that. The air and water in this city is far cleaner than it was 40 years ago. There is really almost no comparison. The Hudson River and the East River were toxic sewers in the 1960s and 70s, really into the 1980s, and they're not anymore. And while the air is not as clean as it should be or could be in New York, it's cleaner than it was. In the early 1960s, until we stopped doing this in apartments in Manhattan, Every large apartment had a basement incinerator and the garbage was burned. We literally burned our garbage all over Manhattan. And in the late, uh, late uh, evening, early morning hours, there was a little haze over the city of New York. And uh, it wasn't a pretty sight. <laughs> okay, food. I've talked about food earlier this semester. The food industry is a huge multi-billion dollar multinational business. Um, most of the people on this planet are no longer involved in the production of food. And the food supply system is largely invisible to the average person. A group of students I worked with last year uh, in the MPA in Environmental Science and Policy Program did an analysis as a workshop project of how New York City gets its food and where it comes from. Very interesting piece of work. And what we discovered is that it's one of the places in New York where the capitalist market works beautifully. If a local a uh, grocery store runs out of strawberries. There's 10 other places that want to sell it any month of the year. The issue will be price. Uh, the issue will be convenience. Uh, but you can get it. And uh, that's part of uh, the advantage of living in a city like this. But we need to think about reducing the ecological impact of some of the production of food. Uh, some of the industrial food suppliers, particularly the suppliers of meat, uh, do all sorts of, of nasty things to the water uh, near the feedlots that uh, these animals live, live on. And so all of those food producing technologies can be fixed. Food production though has to use technology to keep pace with population. I mean, this was actually what Malthus was worried about uh, in his classic equation, that, that the normal pace of production of food would eventually be outstripped by population. And what we have discovered, in fact, is that through the application of technology and industrial farming, we, in fact, have a surplus of food worldwide. Our problem is basically the distribution of it and its environmental impact. So industrial agriculture has to be made less destructive. Energy, fertilizer, and water has to be used more efficiently. And if it is, and again, that's a management and a technology issue, then we can feed the seven or even 10 billion people that it looks like the planet will grow to. Then there's the issue of developing land 
and handling our waste. Human population is growing and settlements are in increasingly fragile and vulnerable areas. If you talk to the people in New Orleans, they can tell you what that's about. So waste streams have to be more carefully managed to maintain human and environmental health. We have to make sure that our waste is treated, that it's seen as a resource, that we recycle, that we reduce it, that we transform it chemically so it doesn't stay toxic and contaminate our land and groundwater. Land use and settlement patterns can be managed to reduce environmental impacts. So in America, suburban sprawl was a very destructive way to develop. Well, now we have large parts of inner cities that are ripe for development and you're starting to see some of the redevelopment of those cities. And so that, I think, is what you're going to see, more densely settled areas uh, with waste uh, better managed uh, and with less impact uh, on the ecology of the planet. But this last point I made earlier, emergency response and post-disaster reconstruction are going to have to become routine because we're going to have flooding and hurricanes and earthquakes now more and more where there are people. I mean, it just makes sense. When I was growing up in the 1960s, the planet only had three billion people. Today, we have more than twice that. Now, it's not going to grow much more uh, then, I mean, probably the population of the planet will peak at 10 billion, but that's still three times as many as were around when I was growing up. And they got us, they're living somewhere. And, and what it means is the probability of them being impacted by natural disasters is greater. So we have to build a governance system that accommodates that. We have to build a way to respond to emergencies and reconstruct after those emergencies take place. And then there's the issue of human conflict. Wars target people, but also uh, can target human systems. The idea in warfare is actually to damage an enemy's capacity to make war. So, you know, and this is not a new thing. Sherman's march to, during the Civil War, they burned everything in sight. They, it was an ecological disaster for the South. Um, so warfare itself poses environmental threats and threats to sustainability. But modern weapons of mass destruction are truly uh, the heart of our problem. Chemical warfare, biological warfare, uh, nuclear war, uh, everything that you do to manage the planet uh, can be affected by that. And uh, as I said earlier in the semester, John Kennedy in his famous uh, American University speech after he uh, uh, faced down Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis looked at nuclear a nuclear exchange for what it really is, which would have been an ecological catastrophe for the planet. And he, and he said, you know, we all live on this small planet, uh, we all cherish our children, we're all mortal. And so our common humanity has to win out over the use of weapons of mass destruction. Now, uh, so far, it's holding. There's only been, you know, one uh, you know, one war where nuclear weapons were used, it was used twice, and it's never been used again. Uh, now, that doesn't mean it won't be used again, but it hasn't been used again, which tells you that we're capable of controlling these things. It doesn't mean we're going to, but it means we're capable of it. And the long run here uh, is that we have to figure out a way to put this genie back in the bottle. All progress made in other arenas of sustainability could be undermined by a war fought with weapons of mass destruction. So for that reason, the issue of global security dominates all other issues and is the single most important of all sustainability issues. If you don't deal with this issue, if this issue is not addressed, it really doesn't matter what else you do. Okay, so let's talk about money. Resources now spent on management practices that are not sustainable will shift over time to those that are. The private market is already starting to do this. The fact that the green part of the U.S. economy is growing faster than the rest, even during the recession, is an indicator of that. But we're also going to have to find the capital for the transition to a green economy. The smart grid is not going to be cheap. The, uh, the, the electric uh, vehicles that we need during, uh, are going to need to be, we need to, need to fund the infrastructure. 
Some of this capital will be raised by the private sector, by utilities, uh, but I think we're also going to need to see, at some point, our taxes go up uh, to amass the capital. Obviously, it's not going to happen in the next 24 months uh, with, the, with the folks that have just been elected to control the House of Representatives. I think that more efficient and renewable energy will reduce the percentage of the GDP devoted to energy. And I actually think that sustainability is a way to create a more efficient and effective economic machine. Because in the long run, something that's renewable will be cheaper than something that you use and throw away. And by reducing the ecological impact of our development, we will reduce the cost of the cleanup that will inevitably follow. I mean, you may not realize it, but you're now paying the cost of all the cleanup of toxic waste that were dumped in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It's part, every time you buy something, you're paying for that cleanup because most of the cleanup costs are in fact being borne by the private sector. So we need to figure out a way to do that. But our organizations and our political system is focused on the short run. Elections are every two or four years. Corporations are managed to quarterly uh, and, and even more frequent metrics of productivity and profit. And so this creates organizational and management challenges. And we need to develop the capacity to analyze these impacts. We need to know when we're doing things. We need to take these new technologies and apply them. And we need to know how to do that. That takes skill. We need to understand how to be change agents in organizations and how to rapidly change the standard operating procedures. It's not enough to have a new technology available. We need to know how to use it. And very often when a new technology comes in, uh, it breaks down. You know, buy yourself a new iPod when they just come out. You, know? you, know, it, you, don't, you never want to be the early adopter, right? Because you know you're going to be bringing it back to the store. We need leadership by people trained in the field of sustainability management. Surprise, surprise. Most organizational leaders are either lawyers or MBAs, okay? The people that run organizations, the people running Columbia University are lawyers. A couple of MBAs, you even have a couple of PhDs in there, but typically speaking, the people that run organizations have those backgrounds. They have no training in the physical dimension of sustainability. They don't know the science of environmental impacts or the engineering of resource or energy efficiency. So sustainability managers are needed to analyze and implement organizational changes designed to reduce resource use while building production. And I've been making this point uh, in things I've been writing and things I've been talking about for quite a while now, which is to say that, you know, in the, in the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s, we added financial management and then information management to what a manager had to learn and understand to be effective. To be a sophisticated manager of a modern organization, you better know how to read a financial statement. You better understand how to read a performance measurement system and design one and how to integrate that into your financial measures. Well, now we're going to add the physical dimensions of sustainability in resource use, environmental impacts. That's going to become the language of management. And you are going to be among the first people using that because it's going to give you a competitive advantage. Because the companies that take that into account are going to win. Walmart didn't come to this because they were altruistic and loved bunnies. They came to it because the green they liked was in their currency. Okay? And that is why this is going to happen. All of this is going to happen because it's going to make organizations more competitive in the global marketplace. Because if it doesn't, it's not going to get used. The organizational capacity for managing sustainability requires an understanding of new technology and environmental impacts, public policy rules and incentives, financial costs and benefits, and the dynamics of organizational change. You need to know all of that to make this happen. And that's basically what we've been trying to do this semester in this course. That's really been what this whole thing's been about. You know, and I want to talk a little bit about government because First, we have this issue of global policy. And as I said, I don't see the force of national sovereignty fading. I don't see a world government coming in. So nation states are going to still be the main unit of government. But local governments are going to do a lot here. 
Uh, provincial and state governments are going to do a lot here. Uh, and we're going to have to find ways of coming to global agreements on a lot of things. Because, you know, take an issue like marine debris. You know, the, the bottles of beer that go into the ocean uh, in Germany, you know, or in Europe, I should say, they find their way to our shores. You know, uh, if you, you can look at some of these slicks of garbage moving across the ocean. The, and I have a, a beach house out in Long Island, or a house near the beach. I shouldn't just call it a beach house. I'm a block and a half from the ocean. But every day in the summer in Long Beach, they come there and they rake the beaches with uh, big tractors that rake up the beaches. And then guys follow it with, uh, with, with little sticks and with garbage bags. And they pick up all the garbage. Because every, and it's not coming from the beach. It's coming from the ocean. Okay? All that stuff is washing on shore over and over again. It's just a metaphor, because this stuff isn't that harmful. It's just, a, it's just irritating and unpleasant. But some of the stuff getting in there is not just irritating and unpleasant. It's killing fish, and it's destroying natural habitats. So we do need to deal with that. We need to figure out ways of addressing these global problems. Government is a central player in establishing and maintaining the sustainability at the community, city, state, national, international level. This idea is really to regulate economic activity. And I've often used the metaphor of traffic regulation. You know, in a city like New York, you better have a traffic light at most corners or the cars are going to crash into each other. In a modern, complex, interconnected, global economy, we need the same thing to make sure that we don't crash into each other as we get around from place to place. The idea that an unregulated market can achieve sustainability is just absurd. The market can do a lot to make production more effective and efficient and can make our lives better, but it is not going to achieve sustainability without rules. The rules have to come from government. So government and the private sector have to work together to advance the economic development with the least impact. And this is really we have to get to a level of sophistication that we certainly don't see in Washington today where we're still fighting this ideological war of the mid-20th and early 20th century, you know, the communists against the capitalists. This is a ridiculous ideological battle. It has nothing to do with reality. The most effective economies are going to be the ones where the people that make things and make services and the people that do regulation learn to work together in a sophisticated way. And we have to figure out how to do that. If we don't, we're doomed. Because we need a mixed economy. We need rules, but we also need the freedom for entrepreneurs to thrive. And this is not an easy thing to do. But we're going to have to figure out a way to do it. So that's basically the conclusion of the class. We need that sophistication. We've got to figure out a way uh, to make it happen. And it's going to happen, I think. But I think it's going to happen because I'm one of these guys that uh, tends to be optimistic. All right? So I think it's going to happen also because we really don't have a lot of choice.